We remember them in prayer today. Um, remember Frankie's going to be traveling this week a long ways, so we need to remember him in prayer as he goes. Uh, and um, there were a couple of others, Miss Katie, different ones. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you today that we can come. I ask you, Lord, that you would be near these families that we request your prayer for. We pray for Miss Katie. Pray for the other one, Lord, that's had a stroke. Pray, Lord, for Harriet this morning that you will be with her. And Lord, may these ribs heal speedily. I ask that, Lord, for this lady who's endured so much so far. I ask you, Father, that you would be with the different ones that we know that are having family situations and be in those families. In some way, Lord, work in them and bring them to that place that they need to be in you. And I ask you now, Lord, to help us in this lesson. Help us, Lord, that it'll be something that we will that will open our eyes and keep them open so that we will not be seduced into anything that's ungodly. And we'll thank you for it, for we ask it in your name. Amen. Last week, we had the battle of self-will. I'm going to do what I want to do. I do not care. And last week, we found out God will let you do it. He'll try to stop you in every way. But if you're going to be determined to do it, he'll let you go ahead and do it. But be, be uh, prepared for consequences because you're going to have consequences too. And they are not always good. They are generally not bad. Oh, they are generally bad, rather. Um, I think if you put... The battle last week of self-will and the battle this week of seduction, they are like twins. They are conjoined twins at the head. They're not separated. Balaam had already lost the battle of seduction before he lost the battle of self-will. Do you follow? Seduction is saying you are convinced you're right even though everybody else can see you're wrong. But you will stand your little ground, I'm right. And that's what Catalan was doing. He was convinced he was right. And therefore, self-will, if I'm right, I'm going to do what I think I ought to do. That's just the way it goes. So do you understand that part, that we got conjoined twins here in this one thing? Now, Salem, he was seduced by three things. The first was pride because he believed that he was the greatest person that had, greatest prophet that had ever lived or ever would live. He was known. He's called to curse this people from a distance of 350 to 600 miles. We don't know exactly, but in that time frame, you're talking from the Jordan River to the Euphrates River. That's how far away it was, and he was known that far away when they had no telephones, no telegraph, no nothing except riding a donkey or a camel to wherever you were going and telling it. So he has pride. He knows he's good. They call on him all the time. Also, he had position because he was called upon to, uh, to curse people or bless people from people that were in positions, like in leadership. Uh, kings would call him to come, just like Balaam did, to curse this people for me that I can win. So he knows he's not talking to the people that you're going to go to. Where did I see that one? I saw it the other day. Madam so-and-so, if you go in there, she'll tell you your future. Actually, there's one right up the road. If you want someone close, that's one just about a, a couple of miles up the road here. She's got her sign out in front of her little trailer, uh, Occults. Yeah, she's there. But this man wasn't doing with 5 and $10 people. He's dealing with 
high up people. And the last thing was money. What was it that Balak said? I'll give you my house full of silver and gold if you'll just come. So with all of that going on, he knows he's right. He has been seduced to think he is absolutely right, even though the rest of us could see he was wrong, okay? Now, the deal today is going to be subsequent to what he was doing last week. And he, what he was doing was he was giving a plan to the king of the Midianites and the Moabites for a way that God would curse the people. And that was, he was going to have the women of the Midianites and the Moabites, and these were temple prostitutes, go into the camp of Israel. I'm thinking the outskirts of the camp, because I don't think he, they would have gone in very far because somebody would have probably stopped them. But he's saying to them, look, go in, seduce them, talk to them, and convince them to come to your side and go to your temple, go to where you worship your god, Baal. It'll be a fun experience. You will like it. It isn't just sitting there like they do in your church and you just hear somebody read the Psalms or read this or that. No, 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 no. And they didn't even have Psalms at that time. But it's not going to be a boring thing is what I'm saying. This is going to be a good thing for you and we're going to feed. Now keep in mind, the Midianites and the Moabites are both related to Israel. Midian, who the Midianites come from, they came from a son of Abraham. After Sarah died, he remarried, married a woman named Keturah, and had six children by Keturah. If you thought he was old at 100, and that was something having Isaac, it's about two years after that, that he marries Keturah and has six more boys. And one of them is Midian. So you got a half brother in here to Israel. The Moabites, uh, they were descendants from his nephew Lot. Lot had been raised by Abraham because his father had died. But Lot had gone and was living in Sodom. And then, of course, we know there was destruction coming to Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and angels were sent, angels were sent to uh, Sodom to get Lot and his family and bring them out before it was destroyed. Remember? And Abraham, that's where we get you Jew people down. I think that's exactly where it comes from, because Abraham started pleading for him and said, if that's 50 people, will you destroy the whole place for 50 righteous people? Wouldn't you save it for 50? And the Lord said, yeah, I will. And then he went down to 40, 30, 20, finally ends up with 10, which is probably the number of Lot's family there in Sodom. And the angel says, okay, if you can find 10, I won't destroy it didn't find 10. But two of Lot's daughters went with him when he left, and they decided their father needed to have his name carried on because the rest of them had been killed in Sodom, ever how many there were. So his eldest daughter comes up with the idea of that we will have children by our father, and you know the whole sordid story. So you've got here relatives again of Israel, through Lot, okay? These are kinsmen. Now, generally, you don't think of kinsmen fighting you like this, but there are times that this is going to happen, and it isn't pretty when it happens. So there we go. Now, I told you that Balaam is the one who did this planning, and Numbers 31 and verse 16 is where we get the proof of it, okay? 31, 16 is where Moses gets very, very angry with uh, 
those that went out to battle against him, and we'll get to that later. But he says to them, when these came near, that's verse 32, I want this one. Uh, Moses said to them, have you saved all the women alive? This is after a battle that we'll get to. Just stick it up in your brain somewhere, and we'll pull it out in a minute. He said, behold, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord. We know he did it in the matter of Peor. Peor was, it was Baal of Peor. Peor is the area that Baal was the god over, and he was the big god there. And he said, and there was a plague among the congregation of Israel. So we know from that for a fact Balaam did this thing. No question. Now, at this point also, we go back, we got to go back to Numbers 25 to get the rest of it. The plan wasn't just to uh, seduce the women just to um, go to church with them, as it were, Okay. These activities that they wanted to do was to tie them to Baal. In chapter 25, we'll start at verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. He does not mention here Midian, but Midian was in it too. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Let's stop there. Now, like I say, they're not just going to church. They're eating with them. They're feasting with them. They're having illicit sex with them because that's part of their worship. And these guys are all for it. This is a good church to go to. You know? We're having a lot of fun here, not knowing what they're really doing. And it says, join means they're tied to Balaam. It's like putting a rope around them, and this is who you're going to worship. And it's of their own free will, no less. They're doing this themselves. Nobody, none of the Israelites are saying do this. Most of them don't even know what's happening, and if they did, they were shut. They had their mouths shut. They, well, nobody was saying a word about it. And, of course, this is not going to be good. So, and you remember also, this is a second generation out of Egypt. Most all of the first generation is dead. We don't know if the next 24,000 will end it. We're not sure of that. But we know there's going to be some more that will die before they're going to cross the river. That's another thing we need to keep in mind. They are sitting on where they, on this, on the, wait a minute, let me see my river. My river's here. They're sitting on the east of Jordan getting ready to cross over to go into the promised land. They can see it. Moses is going to go up to the top of Mount Pisgah, look at it all, and then God's going to say, okay, you're coming home right now. And that's going to happen in the next couple of, you know, a few days actually from here. They are doing it when they're ready to go to their inheritance. Now, that's important. It's important because these people, one thing, were led so easily away. It's like they weren't there when they were in slavery. They don't remember what that was like, really. The only ones that are there from coming out of Egypt were those that were 20 years old and up. And we're 40 years beyond that. And they have some memory of it and all. It's still there, but it's not as fresh as it was the day that they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. I mean, you're talking 40 years later. It's not quite the same as it was then. 
especially if they had a parent that was saying, hurry up and get across because these waters could fall down any minute. Get across. Now that would impress you. But if you're just walking along, yeah, looks good. Never seen an aquarium like this before, you know? Hey, it's not quite the same 40 years later. They don't remember at that age, if they were 20, all the labor that it took that they were building, all the bricks they had to make, all the stones they had to cut, being slaves to uh, the Pharaoh and building him temples and everything that he had, city even. This isn't all that real. We're talking 40 years later, and a lot of them were much less, old, less than that, and a lot were born during this time of 40 years. You got a multiplication here of people born in the wilderness. They don't know anything about Egypt. And here they are sitting, ready to go across, and yet they're not getting ready to get up and move today. And these that are going along with these, uh, these women, they forgot about the day, or some of them weren't even born, the day that the Lord came down on Mount Sinai with thunder and lightning and smoke and God billowing out. I don't mean that in the wrong way, but with a very loud voice saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image. All of that. Some of them weren't there. A lot of them weren't there. So that didn't, they heard about it, but they didn't see it. And that's what happens a lot of times. We hear what happened a long time ago. It's like I was, I was raised in church. So I remember the stories of when in the 20s, Pentecost first came to our area. And my great grandmother was a, what they called a shouting Methodist because she was, went to the tent meeting. People were saved. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They, some of them, the, they were so slain in the Spirit and so out of it, that they said they were having to tow them home in wagons. They just put them on the wagon and drove them home. You know, I, I heard about it, but I didn't see it. Was it still, it was real to me because it was my great grandmother. I'm like, well, I'd love to have seen that happen, you know, where she's shutting her hair down because you all had to wear a, beard, a bun. With women's hair was always put up in a bun. I think it was a rule. You could have a little round one or you could have a figure eight one. But you had a bun of some kind, okay? But we hear about it, but if you're not there to experience it, it isn't as real to you. When uh, I was at Oral Roberts' meeting one time and uh, he came to Norfolk, I saw a little boy, 10 years old, go up for healing, and he had the exact same thing that our angel had had, with his little feet turned in and all, and Oral Roberts prayed for him, and I was sitting, I was like facing you, and he was over there where y'all were sitting, so I had like a side view of it, and I saw that child's feet straighten and his legs straighten, and when Oral Roberts asked him, what did you feel like? He said, it was like electricity. I remember that because I saw it myself, and I remembered, Angel was only about three years old, I remembered that day myself, and it was exactly what I had done. You see what I'm saying? These people, are, they're not there. They haven't, re they haven't experienced it. So they're so vulnerable, it was like leading sheep to the slaughter. We had a chaplain in uh, Germany, <laughs> had a sign on his wall. <laughs> it was a Baptist minister. <laughs> he said, diplomacy is being able to tell a person they are going to hell and make them happy to be on their way. <laughs> that was diplomacy to him. And if you think about it, that's true. You can tell someone they're leading them, make them happy to be going, no matter they're straight, heading straight to hell. Who knows? Anyway, these people fell for all of that. 
They fell for, they were seduced into it. And we don't know how much the women were paid to do this. Might have been a lot, might have been nothing. Might have been the Israelites paying them. You don't know how that thing went. But you wonder, how could it happen? Well, one thing, they didn't see it. Another thing is, things like this happen today. All the time. People are seduced. And I was thinking of this as I was talk, thinking about the families involved there, of how, how could it be that they would follow these women to worship Baal? And the thought came, seduction comes from the outside to attack you. You're being told something. They're trying to change your mind. But self-will, the conjoined twin, comes from within. That says, I'm going to do it. I'm convinced because of what you said, and I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway. And that's where they were. I thought about it with um, marriages that are so, so many today are destroyed because of infidelity. And do you think they wake up one morning and say, oh, today is a good day. I think I will just start up a friendship and a relationship with somebody at work, and we will be happily ever after. It doesn't start that way. It starts off with friendship. How are you? Remember I told you about my father and the rule in the house? You cannot leave the property if there has been a disagreement. You got to stay on the property, that 50 by 100, lot, 100 foot lot, until it's resolved. Because if not, you're setting yourself up. Friendship, it can start. And then after that, what is, it gets a little more, well, this person starts looking better and better. They're understanding you. Your husband or wife at home isn't. They don't understand a thing. You try to tell them and they're not there. And they don't talk to you. They don't do this, they don't do that. And it just keeps snowballing and snowballing and snowballing until all of a sudden, it, it, it happens like with uh, Julianne the other week at, at Target. She came home, she said, I couldn't believe what happened today. I said, what? Because you never know what's going to happen when you're in that line. Family came. Husband, wife, two children. Nice looking family. Father was there putting everything on the belt to go down to be scanned. Julianne scanning. All of a sudden, the father's phone rings. And the father tells the little boy, answer it. I'm busy. And the child answered it. And child is then saying, who is this? What did you say? And the mother said, give me the phone. She took the phone, said, who is this? And evidently she said, well, this is so-and-so's fiance. She took the phone, handed it to her husband and said, it's your fiance calling you. Julianne said, she took the kids, left everything on the counter, walked out of the store with the keys, left the guy standing there with his fiance on the phone. And Julianne's like, uh, do I keep scanning this or what, you know? And the guy just looked at him and said, um, you can just cancel this whole thing. And that's a shame. Here he's got what looks like a perfect family, but it isn't. How did it get there? Because of one thing, you get too familiar with people at times. You think they're friends, but friendship can bloom and it can have a whole bunch of thorns on it. When you feel that, run away. And if you think it's just young people, I've heard of people 50, been married 50 years and they're getting divorced because they're not compatible any longer. 
I'm thinking you've lived with somebody over half your life and you're not compatible? How is that? That that's, just does not compute with me. When Joseph was confronted with it in scripture, he ran away, left his coat and ran away. And sometimes I think that's what people need to do. Get away and don't go back. Yeah. The, another thing, and listen to them. And I know none of the real young ones are here, but they're going to go online and hear it. Okay, so just bear with it. Because this is a lot for them. A <laughs> couple of you are here. You haven't been married too awful long compared to well, I've been married more, longer than some of these have been born, twice as long as some. Shocked by a doctor when I told him I'd been married longer than he'd been alive. <laughs> to put a whole new outlook on him taking care of me at that point. <laughs> but when, listen to what, if somebody says, I don't know. It looks like to me that person's getting awfully friendly. Why are they calling you? How come? Listen to that because there's a reason for it. We had a lady in Arizona when Pastor was doing the youth. She used to call and talk to him for the dumbest things forever. And it got to where we were saying, wait a minute, this is going too far here. So every time she called, I was talking to her. So she didn't. She quit calling as much after that. It put a stop to it. You see what I'm saying? Because I was reading her. <laughs> Who knows? We're not going here. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Another thing, people that do this, they put a lot of time, energy, and effort into it. You got to put a lot of time, energy, and effort to meet someone that you're not supposed to be with and not be caught. The band teacher just recently in another city seemed like everything was good in the family until he said he was going to downtown and all his, he went downtown and turns out his wife decided she needed to go downtown for something with a friend only to find he wasn't downtown doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was meeting another woman shattered everything. What appeared to be a very happy marriage. Gone. He, he didn't plan too well. Another thing, minimize the faults and maximize the good. You can find fault all day long with somebody. Try to find something good in your spouse. Really, you know, Sometimes our spouses, we get, all of us do, we're tired, we're having to do something that's got to be done, and we can grumble and gripe about it. Why do I have to do this? You should have better, I should just leave. I mean, people say that stuff all the time. It's in a moment. A half hour later, after they've eaten and rested, they're fine again. I often say marriage is like taking care of a baby. You have to make sure they're fed. You have to make sure that they're dry and happy and have sleep. A, fussy, a baby that isn't sleeping is a fussy baby. A baby that's hungry is crying until it gets fed. I don't care how much you try to appease it. Not going to work till it gets fed. Yours like that? Well, that one is probably wanting her mama. <laughs> but nothing's going to satisfy her till she gets what she wants. Now, is she going to be happy later on going back to grandma? Yeah, but not right now. Not right. You see what I'm saying? All of these things were happening to Israel like men that happened the same today. Exact same thing. I would be so good to you if I was married to you. Well, yeah, wait. Wait a little bit. It's going to turn in a little bit, I can tell you. 61 years has taught me a lot because I've been there, up, down, in the middle, and around. So take precautions for your marriage. 
My husband does a lot more for me today than he ever thought he was going to have to do the day we got married. He really did. I mean, now my dad did tell him I've had her tonsils out, I've had her appendix out, everything else is on you. <laughs> <laughs> and he had no idea what everything else was going to be, I'll tell you. There was no thoughts of what was going to happen and in these years. He had no idea. But you see what I'm saying? You take the whole bundle and you make the best of it. Stay with it. It'll get better. Um, does it happen? Um, it happens a lot in ministry. You would know that. A lot of times it happens in ministry. But you know why? Because women always think the pastor is perfect. I know. Just ask the wife. <laughs> Do what? Just ask the wife. That's right. <laughs> ask the wife. You know why? Because he's always dressed up. He always looks nice. He always is so comforting and loving to everyone. Yeah. And they put him on a, a pedestal. But when he gets home, he's not on the pedestal. It's not that he is bad, but he's a person. He's not God. He's a person. So, you know, we got to look out for these things. Um, in workplace, there was a movie, Other Things That Will Seduce You. There was a movie a few years back. I can't remember the name of it, but we showed it, I think, here. And it was a man that was out of work for some reason. He needed a job, and this other good man found him a job, and he was doing very well at the job. And in fact, he was doing so well, he was one that was being considered for a promotion. But the one that wanted to promote him was also a Christian man. And he wanted to have an employee that um, he could trust. So as he called these individuals in to interview them, he said, this is the job I want. But now, when we're getting in, I think it was shipments. I want you to take part of them and put them back and not count it and then we'll claim a loss on it, something to that effect, okay? And everybody that came in would say, uh-huh, I, I can do that. That's what you want, you're the boss. Except this one man came and he had told his wife, he said, I'm going in for this interview and I've got to give him my answer because he'd already been told what to do and it was go home, think about it over the weekend, I'll see you Monday. And he told his wife, he said, I might lose my job, but I cannot do that. And he went into the uh, man's office that was doing the interview, and the man said, um, have you decided what you are going to do, if you're going to take this job or not? And the man told him, he said, I'm sorry. He said, um, I cannot take that job because I cannot be dishonest like that. I have to be honest in all my dealings and truthful. And so I can't do that for you. So I'll just stay where I am, or if you want to fire me, you can do that. And he, the employer looked at another man that was in the room with him, and they just sort of smiled at each other. They said, you're what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Somebody that will be honest and not succumb to seducing things, not being seduced into it because it would be better for you. It works in that way. That's where like Salem, or Balaam, he wanted the promotion and he was willing to do anything for it. The only thing we can give him credit for is that after about the third time when he saw that the Lord was pleased to bless Israel, that he just went all out. Yeah, they are blessed. All the, and he went into it. But we need to learn not Keep your eyes open for seduction. You're not above it. I'm not above it. You think Satan is going to let you get through this whole line without ever seducing you to do something you ought not to do? That's foolishness. He is going to try this method to try to get you, because once he gets you like that, then he can add to it and add to it and add to it. 
It's not good. So anyway, we're going to go back to Israel. Now that you've seen the present day, what happened, we'll find out the results of what happened here. It says in verse 3, the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel. That means he was so mad. We don't think of God getting angry and mad. He's a God of love. True. But God does get angry at sin. He is very angry at sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And here's what happened to him. The Lord said to Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Kill them. Cut off their heads. Hang them up. You remember the story of London Bridge is falling down, falling down? You remember the little rhyme? You know where it came from? Because so many people were being beheaded in England and their heads put on the, uh, rip, the bridge going over the river to show people this is what happens to traitors. That one man they executed chopped his head off before they had a picture. And they had to take his head, put it back on him, set him up with his clothes on and paint a picture of him. As the guy said, he was a little pale, you know. <laughs> but they at least had a picture of him. Then he goes on to say to Moses, say to the judges of Israel, slay every one of his men that was joined to Baal Peor, and behold, one of the children of Israel, this is where it's not good. One of the children of Israel brought a, a brother of Israel, brought a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This man, Zimri, had the audacity to flaunt the sin of, that was going on with the prostitutes to bring a Midianite woman through the camp all the way to the middle where Moses and Aaron and Phineas and Eleazar were. Or Aaron was dead, excuse me. He wasn't there. Take this woman into the tent. And everybody knew what was going to happen inside that tent. And I'm sure Moses was standing there like dumbfounded. I cannot believe this is happening. When we have been killing men for being joined to prostitutes, we have been killing them. The people are here weeping before God because of the sin, trying to repent for the sins being committed. And this guy takes this woman into this tent. Phineas, however, was quite a bit younger. Phineas was Eleazar's son, the high priest's son. He t rose up from among the congregation that was praying, took a javelin in his hand. He went straight into the tent after the man of Israel and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague was 20 and 4,000. 20 and 4,000 because of a plague, and Phineas stopped it by killing that man and that woman. One, he must have been an awful mighty man to have done that, or else he was empowered by the Lord to, to jab that through two bodies at one time. That is a powerful stroke, but it stopped the thing. Of course, Phineas was rewarded because the Lord said, 
He has turned my anger. He has a covenant of the priesthood forever. But look how many paid for the sins they were committing. 24,000 in one day killed. That's a lot. That's an awful sin. Then it goes on after that. Now, after that, he goes, the Lord says, for them uh, to go to battle. And that's in chapter 31. I told you we'd get back to it. The Lord says to Moses, avenge the people of Israel of the Midianites. And again, this is the Midianites and the Moabites. Now, Midianites, Moabites, uh, Edomites, Amorites, uh, Amalekites. I mean, you got all of them in there together. But he says the Midianites, they're kin, and afterwards you're going to be gathered to your people. In other words, you send them off to war this time, and then you're going to come. You're going to die. But this is your last act. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves to war. Let them go against the Midianites and avenge the Lord of the Midianites. They end up sending 12,000 men to battle. As they, they, it was 1,000 from every tribe, okay? They went there and they were successful in their battle. And they did all the normal things. They burnt the cities, they killed all the men. They took all the women and the children as captives and slaves and all the animals and said, we've had a great victory, let's go home. And they went to Moses in the camp. When everybody saw him coming, I mean, it's hard to miss uh, 12,000 men marching towards you. Camp goes out to meet them to see, you know, this great victory that they have. Only thing is, when they got to Moses and Eliezer, when he got there, Moses wasn't as joyful as could be. Moses says, well, let me read you first what they did. Uh, Phineas, he did go with them to battle. And they, they, wore, they slew the kings of the Midianites. They did that. Beside the rest of them that were slain, and it gives all the names. And at the very last it says, Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. The man that had caused the whole problem was killed by the Israelites for what he had done. He wasn't so great after all. He paid with his life for that. That's an awful thing. Then it goes on. They bring the women of Midian captive and all that stuff. Then it says, they brought the captives to pray the spoil unto Moses and Eleazar the priest and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. Moses and Eleazar, the priests, and all the princes, they went out to meet them without the camp. And Moses was angry with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, and the captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. He said, why are you mad, Moses? We won, look. And what does he say? Moses said to them, have you saved all the women alive? How stupid are you? You saved all these women alive? He goes on to say, these are the ones that caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and that was to plague among the congregation of the, the Lord. Now, kill every male among the children, all the baby, little boys, kill all the boys, and kill every woman 
that is not a virgin. Any woman that has lain with a man killed them too. Now, you, that is so awful for our minds to comprehend. We can't hardly think of it. Just to all of a sudden turn around and start killing the ones next to you, all the women that were in this, all the little boys. But there's a reason. In order to, these little boys are gonna grow up to be men. And these little boys are gonna be men that are gonna be fighting against you. It's an awful thought that they had to kill them all. But because of who they were, the Midianites who were going to have war with Israel for all three judges, they're going to be there. But to kill all of it, all because they were seduced by women in the beginning. That started the whole thing, the seducing of the men by the women. And look at the awful cost it was. It's hard to imagine that. And I can imagine there was a lot of, I don't know, maybe they didn't want to have to do that, but they had to do it. Sometimes you've got to do to kill sin that can come against you. And I'm not talking literally here, okay? I'm not saying go out and, and, and get your guns and mow down anybody that, that's causing a problem. But the thing is, you can kill some things just by staying away from it and not going by it. it if you take a plant, and, you, and Lord knows we've had some plants planted in our yard. We didn't have a single flower till this week. But anyway, we, if you put it there and it's not watered, it's going to die. If you don't take care of it, it's going to die. But if you leave it alone and you don't want it, it will die. You see what I'm saying? The only thing that won't die is are weeds. And what are you going to do with them? You're going to spray them with Roundup and anything else that you can. Right? Some things that are good will even die because somebody was seduced. It's an awful thought that that could be. Other things like the vines here in Carolina, it takes a lot to kill them. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot, because some of these things grow a foot a day. But they have to be killed. And you might have to go back and kill it a second time. My husband, he does not weed like I do. I pull out the roots. He just chops off the top. And I keep telling him, when you chop off the top, the roots are going to get better. They're getting stronger. They're getting more of them. Now he uses Roundup more. So it doesn't. But you see what I'm talking about? There are things in our lives that we've got to kill at times. When it comes creeping in, when you, you have a bad feeling about something, and somebody is doing something that not quite right, you need to take it then, as I say, nip it in the bud. Don't let it grow. Don't encourage it. Don't feed it. But stop it in its tracks. You see what I'm saying? It can be done. And these people, like I say, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They're at the end of their journey. Some of us are getting near the end of our journeys. But do you think Satan's going to say, well, they're almost done. Might as well leave them alone now. They've gone this far. He's not going to say that. He's going to say, we've got one more chance. Let's do this. We've got one more chance. Be aware of seduction and self-will. Because I don't care how old you are. And Mabel and I are probably the top two here. We know you can still be seduced even at our ages. Be aware. You don't want to be caught in this thing. 
it will bring death to something. It'll bring death to something. Lord, it's such a hard lesson. It really is. But it's so important, Lord, that we we do what's necessary to save our souls and the souls of our families. And there's so many things, Lord, that try to seduce us, young people, children, families, Lord. Today, Lord, give us eyes to see, to see those things that can be so very dangerous to us. And Lord, help us to be what you want us to be until that day we do cross that river. Lord, keep each one. Keep each one and protect them, Lord. When they see something that's amiss, give them spiritual eyes to see it and the will to act on it, to correct it. Lord, I ask these things in your name. Amen.